The elf is reading a volume of Cranley Hubert's famous encyclopedia. He looks up, his big round eyes scanning your body, absorbing every detail. He reaches out and takes your hand, turning it this way and that, examining it from every angle. Finally, he pinches your skin, gently tugging at it. Fascinating. He sits back and returns to his book, flicking quickly from page to page, completely oblivious to your presence. I am reading. Is this not evident? My book is in my hands, my face turned away from you, perhaps my eyes not on the page, damnable things. He grabs a metal plate and watches his reflection with one eye as the other shifts left to right and up to down. He repeats the maneuver with the opposite eye. No, they are working quite adequately. It seems you are at fault. Predictable, really. Oh, oh, I see. I crossed a cultural taboo. How difficult. You have my apologies, human. Perhaps I should demand the same from those red-cloaked humans. They laid their hands on me more than once. Ah, yes. The niceties. My name is Fane. I am a scholar from... Well, I am a seeker of knowledge. That is enough. It is pleasurable to meet you. Is there? Wherever do you keep it? Certainly not in your books. I have been reading this one for several minutes, and I have yet to find a single insight into the mysteries of the universe. It is simultaneously too detailed and insufficient. I know the beginning of this tale and the end, but I am rather missing the middle. Tell me, what do you know of your... our world's history? Oh, please. I have no interest in that. Your books are too full of it already. No. I want to know about the Celestial. I want to know about your gods. This text tells me that they created all creatures, but nothing of what came before. Where did these gods come from? Who are their people? Where are the others of their kind? <sighs> of course you don't have any useful information. Why did I expect anything else? Now please, run along. I have a world to decipher. No amount of pestering will get the elf to take his eyes off his book or respond to your questions. You pass through the door and are suddenly face to face with an undead. His skull is bizarrely angular and a glorious jewel sits in the middle of his forehead. The skeleton is quickly leafing through a volume of Cranley Hubert's famous encyclopedia, muttering to himself. No, no, no! What damn fools record knowledge on a pulped tree? It catches fire. It turns into must when wet. It cannot even resist acid. No wonder they're so bloody ignorant. The skeleton looks up and notices you for the first time. Oh, it's you. Shouldn't you be running and screaming or some such? The skeleton groans and looks back to his book, frantically flipping from page to page. Yes, indeed. It's the look of someone that wants to read the bloody book he's holding. Now, if you're really quite finished, I believe you have lifeboats to flee to. Please, I was no more an elf than you are those rags you're wearing. I had a mask, rather ingeniously designed, which allowed me to take that primitive form. A mask that was stolen by that damned witch after her little scene. Still, she'll drown with the rest of these fools, and I will simply pluck my mask from her cold, dead hands. Indeed, just as sensible as getting off a sinking ship and leaving a fellow to his business. I would say good day, but it seems quite likely that you're about to die a rather terrible death, so... The skeleton shrugs casually and returns to his book. As the alcove opens up, you see the same skeleton that you met on the boat before it sank. He's still not wearing his mask. He's leaning over a corpse, prodding and pulling at the skin of its face. Bugger. How on earth am I supposed to... Oh. Perhaps... Skeletal fingers reach down and grip the skin of the dead man's face, pulling sharply upwards. After a few more tugs at the man's cheeks, the skeleton relents, letting the head drop to the ground with a damp thud. Damnation. That stuck fast. I wonder. 
Does the beard act as some form of anchor? Ah! No! Stay back! Don't... Oh, it's you. I must admit I'm surprised. Perhaps you're more buoyant than I suspected. It seems the human that stole my mask was rather more resourceful than I gave her credit for. I chased her here, but she rather seems to have given me the slip. Thus... He turns back to the body, prodding at its face cautiously. Why, its face, of course. What other use would I have for some rotting corpse? A face that seems rather stubbornly attached to his skull. I would normally employ a tool to delicately but viciously rip the face from the body. I could then craft a mask to hide my bone. But as I lack such a tool... The skeleton grabs the corpse by the cheeks and pulls hard, grunty in frustration as the body's skin holds firm. Because my own was stolen from me! And the idea of being chased across Rivalon by every idiot with a torch does not appeal! Oh, get away! Monster, hide the children! Oh. You are simple beasts. And you simply do not like my... Well, not my kind, but those that look like me. So, if I am to traverse this land, I will need a mask to disguise my features. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I have important things to do on Reaper's Coast. I cannot simply sit about waiting for the rest of you to die so I may continue my business in peace. No, I may be an eternal, but my patience has its limits. Indeed, I may be the only eternal. My people seem rather... absent. At least from this realm. As for the others... Well... There is an excavation site at the Black Pit's oil fields. Perhaps there I'll find my answers. A cult? Hardly. We were a race that existed before the idea of race was needed. We were all one. I could ask you to imagine an Eternal as a creature of incredible intelligence and skill. But I fear the limits of your imagination would not do us justice. We studied the mysteries of the universe. We created works of great art. We... We disappeared. But I will find them. Wherever they are, I will find them. We will have our world again. Well, that hardly seems relevant. But if you must know, I was inconvenienced for a time. Several centuries, in fact. Or perhaps millennia. One tends to lose track. I was sealed in a tomb for daring to be curious about the world. It seems our king did not agree that the universe should be explored to its full potential. Perhaps I should thank him. It seems I was spared whatever happened to the others. I wonder if flowers would be appropriate. Ah, well, that is the curious thing. They are clearly absent from this world, and yet they are everywhere. Every one of your races resembles them in some manner. And the statues you have built to your gods look remarkably familiar. Perhaps my people have ascended to some new realm. Or perhaps your gods are merely a folk memory. Regardless, they are not here. But I will find them. Wherever they are, I will find them. I suppose, circumstances being what they are, it could be advantageous. You seem more... At ease in this world than I, a guide would certainly be useful. Excellent. While we are conversing, perhaps you notice that I am rather skilled in, well, all things. Of course, the arcane arts are my little speciality, but being a brilliant wizard does not mean I cannot handle blade or bow. So, which do you require for this enterprise of yours? I could do that with one hand behind my spine. Now, shall we get on? There is rather a lot to see. Splendid. Very well. Let's be off. Is it not enough that you travel with me? Must you speak, too? Go on, then. Bark away. Let's see if we can find any method in it.
Oh, I think of them as little as possible. As much, I imagine, as you think of gadflies that buzz about you. Not that there is anything wrong with you, of course, just that you're... well, not all that impressive. As impeccably mundane as I have come to expect from this world. Regardless, further study will be required. In fact... The skeleton pulls a notebook from his robes and starts scribbling. After a moment, he pauses and looks back to you. Uh, uh, sorry, do carry on. Just act as you do in your natural environment. Simply pretend I'm not here. Go on then, bark away. Let's see if we can find any method in it. Ah, this is perhaps the first intelligent question you have asked. After all, one should always try to learn from one's betters. My people are a race far beyond anything that exists in the world today. We seek to master the secrets of the universe. We craft wonders to last through the ages, long after your crude tools have rusted to nothing. There is a great variety among our people. Some are tall and lithe, others short and muscled. Some come in a variety of eye-catching colors, others you can barely see at all. This is what makes you such an abomination, you see. You almost look exactly like every other human out there, just as every lizard looks like every other lizard. Walking through this world is as repulsively bland as staring at a wall for a century. After a while, the very sight of you disgusts me. Uh, no offense, of course. I... I do not know. There are rumors that some have been found at the Black Pits, an oil field on Reaper's Coast. I was trying to uncover the truth when I was waylaid by these magisters. But wherever the artifacts of my people are, I will find them. We have not simply vanished into thin air. No. No, I should not. Not yet. Not until I know what truly befell my people. And, after all, I am still here, despite the Void Woken's best efforts. Ignorant! I dare say I have a better knowledge of this world than any creature living in it. Oh, I may be missing some social mores or be unaware of what king waged which war, but why nitpick? Waiting for a letter is tedious. What I have gone through is torture. Your history is an interminably dull list of mortals that were born, achieved nothing of worth, and then died. Certainly one may have expanded his kingdom, or another invented some way of pickling fish, but what does it matter? Where will your kingdoms be in 100 years? In 1,000? They will all be dust, along with each and every one of your great heroes. Your people and nations come and go, mayflies screaming their importance at a universe that cannot listen. But the universe is always there. The laws that govern your states change over centuries, but the laws of the world. Even when my people walked this land, a dropped apple still fell to the ground. I have yet to see the mortal king that can decree all apples must fall up from their trees, or order fire to produce cold instead of heat. No, these laws stretch to infinity. Understanding them lets you understand the world. That is knowledge worth having. Everything else is arguing over who has built the prettiest sandcastle as the waves creep closer. The Mask of the Shapeshifter? In my time, it was nothing more than a novelty. A toy, really. I crafted one for my child once. She spent the day trying to convince me that she was her mother, even though the face I used looked nothing like her. Of course, now that toy could be the difference between life and... well... It makes a difference. With that mask, I can shapeshift and walk through this world looking like any other simple mortal. I could look like a lizard, a dwarf, a human, any creature whose face I can procure. It certainly makes traveling through towns easier. Oh, it's quite simple. One just acquires a face, a source orb, and combines the two to make a face mask. Combining several of these single face masks, along with a source orb, will produce a mask of the shapeshifter. Frankly, I'm amazed everyone isn't doing it. 
Fear? Please. Why would I fear these creatures? It's a practical choice. Nothing more. Moving through this world is so much easier when you don't have to lecture some torch-wielding lunatics on the dangers of an open flame. Oh, of course there are. How many hundreds of thousands of you people have died over the years? Almost all of them seem to have been disposed of while still wearing perfectly serviceable faces. It's a terrific waste. Still, without the proper tool to remove the face from a corpse, I cannot take advantage of the many cadavers you're providing. So if you happen across anything that seems capable of ripping a face off a body, please do let me know. <sighs> Trust you bloody-minded beasts to turn a child's trinket into a wicked purpose. People like you are the reason it must be recovered. I am using the mask to keep myself safe from the violence of this world. Who knows what evil it could do in the hands of some mortal witch. Well, I thought a brief swim in the sea, lying in the sun for a while, and maybe read a nice book. Or, perhaps, and this is just a thought, we could find my mask and escape this wretched island. As you approach the blacksmith, you feel a bony hand on your arm. Fane leans in and whispers in your ear. If it would be acceptable, I have an inquiry for this human. It is of a personal nature. And if it would not be acceptable, well, that would render this entire conversation rather awkward. Fane approaches the blacksmith and quietly speaks to her. You can't overhear much, but he seems to be gesturing towards her head an awful lot. Fane's words are quiet, but you hear the blacksmith repeat, Face Ripper, in shock. She slowly starts to back away. What is it with creeps like you and Master Niles? I told him to slither back to his dungeon, and you can get too, freak! Fane backs away, scratching his head. It seems that didn't go as he'd expected. He is lost in thought, though. She must have said something he found interesting. As the Magister turns to face you, you feel Fane stepping up behind you. Have you seen these contraptions? This must be the Magister freak the blacksmith was referring to. He may have the very tool I need to craft my mask. Fane cheerfully explains that he needs something to rip off a person's face, even demonstrating the idea by reaching over and tugging on the Magister's cheeks. Rather than reacting with horror, the Magister seems excited, very excited. He explains that he might have just the thing. However, having and giving seem to be two very different things. He proposes a trade. When Fane asks what he wants in return, the Magister grins widely. Well, Sugar, now that you should mention it, I do, I do smell something quite Delicious on you. Almost smells like a magister I once knew. One I never could convince to visit me here. Atusa by name. Bless you, Poppet. Oh, bless you. And here's the toy you wanted. Fane is clearly not necessarily happy, but certainly content. He gives you a curt nod and stows the contraption in his pack. As you approach the woman, Fane gasps. You turn and see that he's fixated on her. It's her! The wrinkled human that stole my mask! Please, I must speak with her. The woman traces glyphs in the air and you cringe, expecting a barrage of ice and fire. Instead, a bit of smoke sputters forth. She cries to the skies in frustration in a recognizable rail-thin rasp. My lord, I've loved you. I've obeyed you. What's my sin? How long must I suffer? She sees Fane approach and punches her fist in his direction. Her face flushes red. It's her, the one that destroyed the ship to Fort Joy. Her eyes flare with recognition. She demands to know who Fane is, what he is. No one should be able to craft something like his mask. Fane dances around her question and reverses it. Who is she? Who is this lord of hers? She does not seem eager to answer him either. The witch opens her mouth to speak, but something happens. Her face droops and her eyes turn black. Fane, the traitor, shall be destroyed. Her eyes clear and she turns her head to the heavens once more. 
I offer this sacrifice to you. Return me to your side. Make me howl. I must say, I was hoping to enjoy a smug advantage over everyone else. Lacking skin may make me a target for mortals, but I am mercifully immune to mosquitoes. However, they are infuriating when they get in one skull. I can barely hear myself think. I fell victim to the enemy of all great minds. Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of change. These are the things that poison civilizations. I was on the cusp of a glorious breakthrough, but my king's fear held me back. I discovered a veil hanging across the universe, a barrier of pure source. It was amazing, the kind of discovery on which a civilization turns. Who knows what secrets may have been hidden behind that curtain, but my king forbade me from further investigation. Do you know, I never thought to ask, between him purging me and casting me into a traitor's tomb. What a foolish oversight! If only I'd had your prescience and curiosity, I could have saved myself centuries of pondering that very question. Well, certainly he was not pleased with my insistence that we investigate. But the King's word is law. Was law. But the reason I was purged was slightly less... intellectual. After the King refused to let me investigate the Vale, I brought the issue up with others. The Seven Lords. Beneath the King in authority, but far above me. I brought them my research. I showed them everything. I had hoped they would help me convince the King of his error, but before they or I could act, I was arrested and... Well, my sentence was carried out. I mean, yes, I suppose you could have drained the power from it, but that would have weakened it significantly. It would be quite irresponsible. After all, the power of the thing is not the point. It hid something. Who knows what that might have been? The secrets to the universe could have lain behind that curtain. But I was not given the chance to find out. Now, I fear I never will. He ceased to be my king the moment he turned on me. I did nothing wrong. All I wanted was to further the knowledge of the Eternals. Who knows? Had I been allowed to continue my studies, Perhaps I could have warded off whatever catastrophe befell them. The skeleton stands quietly for a moment. I'm not sure. Centuries in a tomb can warp one's memory. I remember the big things, of course. My library, my home, my king, my family. But the rest, it's all covered in a fog. And the more I see of this world, the thicker that fog seems to get. Once I would have boasted that it was the best form of government. Indeed, it was the only form of government we knew. Living forever under the rule of a wise king is one thing. But if that king should turn into a despot, if he should reject philosophy and the natural arts for the sake of power, well, I cannot imagine a worse torture. I was a scholar, researching the secrets of the universe. Had I been allowed to proceed, my people could have ascended to godhood as one. An entire race of deities, with a perfect understanding of the universe. It would have solved all of our problems. Indeed you cannot. Nothing in this world compares to it. We crafted our homes from stone and crystal, using the power of the universe itself to keep them in place. Your people, on the other hand, seem quite content to sit about in smoky hovels held together by straw and filth. It's a mercy I don't have a nose. I cannot imagine how you stand it. They came rather low in my life, alas. My wife and daughter always had to compete with my work for my attention, and my work was always stiff competition. They were often neglected. I wonder how many more years they spent neglected before. Well before whatever happened, happened. Well, of course it is. It was crafted with care. 100% ethically harvested from mortals, too. The quality is second to none. Oh, you simply wait until the creature is dead, preferably of natural causes. Although that does limit your choices somewhat, you may end up with quite a few sagging faces. 
I will never understand why you have so readily accepted aging or digestion. They are frightful pastimes. Uh, up to a point, certainly. They are frightfully loud, but the selection afterwards is quite good. The faces are often what you might call fixer-uppers, but they're young and quite serviceable, if you get them before the flies do. Poison is preferred, of course. No marks to the face, the subject can be of any age, and death is often quite peaceful. Not for them, of course, but it's significantly more relaxing for me. Given enough time, I could walk from this island to the shore, but time is in short supply. I must procure a quick way off this island, and that means procuring a ship. Something which seems unlikely in the depths of this swamp. Perhaps we should explore the coast. I must say, you may not be an Eternal, but you are certainly not as temporary as many of your fellows. You handled yourself well. Personally, I am just glad that I do not have to walk back to Reaper's Coast. Wind travel may be primitive, but it is at least efficient. Livewood? You have taken a dead elf and carved it into a pleasure yacht? I knew you people were barbarians. I had no idea you were sadists, too. Well, no matter. Whatever gets me to Reaper's Coast quickly. I have an excavation site to explore. The only treasure worth digging for. Knowledge. I was investigating a site where several artifacts of my people have been found. Some were even intact. Alas, I was not the only one there. Those red-robed idiots were scurrying about too, trampling precious clues under their ignorant boots. They caught me when I failed to correctly respond to their questions and dragged me here. Still, it's good to be on the move again. They simply asked me what I was doing there, and I simply told them to be gone from my lands. I may have used the phrase pathetic mortals. Come to think of it, I may have used it several times. Damn fools. The faster we leave them behind, the happier I shall be. Well, you see, I have a rather pressing engagement at the Black... The skeleton breaks off mid-sentence as he notices your hand. He pulls out a notebook, flicking through it, running a finger down the pages. Physical contact, voice lowered, coy looks. Good heavens, is this a mating ritual? Why, that would be excellent. I have been curious about this for some time. The social interactions, the expectations, the mechanics. Come now, let's begin immediately. I shall compile my notes afterwards. Fane grabs your hand and enthusiastically pulls you behind the screen. I, uh... Well, that was most unusual. I mean, I had read all the leading authorities on it, but I didn't think... It's just... that thing you did with your tongue, it was quite unexpected. My goodness. It was certainly an experience, but I must admit I was expecting something... more. Not from you! Certainly not from you! It's just that I... well... I felt nothing. Neither the warmth of your touch nor the fire of your passion. I may as well have been churning butter. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong, you were perfectly adequate. Sublime test conditions, really. It's just... well, all these books promised a transcendental experience. Instead, it was merely... biological. Now, if you'll excuse me... The skeleton pulls a notebook from his robes and starts scribbling. You can hear him muttering something about highly unorthodox, lack of sensation and coccyx. You ponder his words as you pick up the last of your belongings. You're almost sure that's what he said. A team? What an interesting prospect. You certainly seemed capable in Fort Joy, and a companion on Reaper's Coast could be quite educational. Very well. I am open to this. I believe you normally spit on your palms to seal agreements, but I seem to lack the fluid and the desire to touch you. I hope a hearty verbal agreement will suffice. Very well, let's be off. Oh, oh, how can one be seasick when one has no stomach? This is heinously unfair. 
Indeed. So I gathered from your earlier prattling. I also met... someone. Oh, nothing is wrong. Simply... unexpected. The person I met was without doubt a god. At least by your standards. When I wore flesh, I knew her as the Lady Armadia. She was one of the seven lords that served our king. Oh no, they're quite gone. The seven seem to be all that remains. And they... Well, I'm not sure what they are. Not quite gods, but not quite eternals. No, they are something else entirely. Naturally, they acted as any lords would. They bowed to their king and sneered at their lessers. And there was an awful lot of sneering, even back then. One can only imagine how much there is now. Oh, uh, what do you want from me? I'm not here to gossip and titter about my lords. If you wish to know what they were like, you need only to look at yourselves. Each of the races were crafted not just in the image of their gods, but in their temperament too. Vrogir was large and strong as his orcs. Xantezza quick and witty as an imp. And Ralic prone to bouts of fighting and boasting, much like every human I've ever encountered. You were crafted as an act of ego, but one can hardly hold that against the creatures. In truth, the lords never troubled themselves with too much imagination. Yes, well, if you are quite finished wasting my time, I believe we have some business to get on with. What would I do? Oh, dear heart, it is not a question of would. It is a question of what will I do. It is only fitting, after all. You worshipped the Eternals as gods. Why not follow one as divine? The Lady Armadia has laid out the plight of the world and begged me to help fix it. It is a grave responsibility, but one that I gladly accept. Yes, and how is that working out, I wonder? Perhaps if your precious Lucian had been a little less mortal, you would still have a divine and the Void Woken would not be trying to chew on my bones. Honestly, you turn your back for just a few millennia and the world goes to stink. Set sail, for the love of all things, set sail. The sooner I am off this carved monstrosity, the better. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I paint a smile and tell you that sitting in the dark, listening to your muffled grunting was the highlight of my day? Are you creatures really so deeply insecure? Good heavens. Yes, my sweet, you were glorious. The slap of your flesh against my bone will live with me forever. And I'm not sure you truly appreciate how long forever is. My problem? My problem is that I experienced what you call an intimate moment and felt not a damn thing. Food has no taste, wine brings no joy, and flesh has no warmth. So yes, pardon me if I don't seem too happy, you pillock. Fay nods as you approach. He seems unusually quiet. I... I don't know. But after everything that's happened, we should not be here. This place feels like the echo of an eternal land. And here, in their own land, something tried to hang the Seven. It's sacrilege at best, and I do not want to see what it is at its worst. I must admit, I'm more worried than I was. I thought this would be a slice of cake, to be quite honest. After all, I am an energetic, fresh-faced skeleton, teaming up with the lady-turned-goddess Armadia. What force could stop two Eternals? Whatever form this void takes, it seems significantly more dangerous than I assumed. We should leave. This place unsettles me. It's rather impressive that a place named Reaper's Coast is even less cheerful than it sounds. Then again, I suppose desolate, boring, and covered in fish heads coast doesn't quite roll off the tongue. Still, here we are. I trust I needn't remind you about our agreement. <sighs> yes. I feared you may have been thinking about cheese or murder or some other organic hobby. Listen closely. It is vitally important that I gain access to the Magister's cave excavation in the nearby Black Pits. Since my emancipation, I have sought clues of what happened to my people. In those caves, I may find answers. 
There are reports magisters have been hauling mysterious ancient artefacts from the ground. I suspect it to be an eternal site. And if even the clucking roosters of the Divine Order can find eternal artefacts, imagine what else must lie there. Well, I would hardly have to break in if I knew that, would I? There may be tablets detailing the history I've missed. Useful relics or ruins showing signs of destruction. Just any hint to help me make sense of it all. In a sense, the lady, or the goddess, Armadia, as you know her, told me the Eternals were wiped out in a war with our king. But wars leave scars, ruins, weapons, bodies, a story writ large across the landscape. I have not read that story, and until I have seen it for myself, I still hold out hope. But of course, please, carry on, O oh dedicated leader. As the creature crawls from the sarcophagus, you hear a gasp of breath. Fane steps forward, never taking his eyes off her. I... I must speak to her. It is vital. Please, stand aside. You hear a gasp from the creature as Fane steps forward. It speaks in a hissing, clicking language that seems both completely alien and somewhat familiar. Fane raises his head and responds in the same jolting, clicking tongue. He seems to be pleading with the creature, his hands outstretched. The creature looks down at him and shrieks in rage. Her gestures are quick, strong and violent. Whatever she said, it seems to have devastated your friend. The verbal barrage continues, but something changes within Fane. He looks up and golden light pours from his skull. When he speaks next, you understand every word, but you're not sure the words are his own. Aetira, Aetira. I had hoped to see you turn to dust in this tomb, alone forgotten, with only your secrets for comfort. Lady Amadia? You're... you possess him? Have you fallen so far that you seek shelter within that? Does your vessel even know what you did? The war you started? The greed and avarice that saw you betray the Eternals? The glow fades, and Fane seems to return to himself. He staggers slightly, exhausted by everything that's happened. The creature turns away from him and, panting, turns to you. Just when I think this land holds no more surprises, I find myself in some place even more dismal than the last. Still, at least this is an interesting variation on dismal. I could be worse. I mean, I could have spent several millennia in the clutches of the void, so... Thank you. That means... something. The Eternals. They're not gone, or they are, but they're not dead. They're in the void. The Seven threw them to the void. They damned them to that, to an eternity of torment. And they did it in my name. They did it because of me. Aren't I? If you open the gate and let a mad dog loose, are you not responsible if it savages a child? I gave them my research on the veil. I gave them a prize to snatch from the king. Worse, I gave them a weapon to use against their own people. The source of the veil would have made them unimaginably powerful, and their theft left enough of a crack for the void to pour in. Every wickedness visited on my people, every evil that stalks this land, it was my fault. True or not, it makes no difference. I did what I did, and my people suffered for it. But if I am to honor their memory, I cannot sit here and mope. I must go on for them, for my family. My loved ones may be gone. The Seven may be corrupt, but I remain. The last true Eternal must survive. And perhaps, just perhaps, I can find a way to bring my people back. Fane grips you by the arm, his hands strong. Come, Godwoken. There is work to be done. Still, at least this is an interesting variation on Dismal. I always thought my path was laid out. Become divine. Preserve what's left of your people. It was such an easy narrative. But what if you could do more? What if you could save them all? And worse... 
What if you had all that power, but they were not worth saving? I don't know. Tell me, what would you do? Fane nods slowly, lost in thought. You're not entirely wrong. Then again... Thank you. I will have to think on this. It... It has been unlike anything I ever imagined. To explore this world with you, to see this world through your eyes, even metaphorically. Well, it has been a privilege. <sighs> Do what you want. What does it matter? My people are gone. Worse than gone. It's all pointless. Well, this all looks familiar. Large, impressive, glowing stones. It certainly has all the hallmarks of my people. Although we did not plaster our faces on every spare surface, that is the doing of your gods. It is not enough for them to curse you with their faces. Must they inflict them on stone too? I mean, at this point, it's just tacky. It certainly has that air to it, but I would make a terrible guide. Whatever place this once was, it was destroyed long before our... before your time. We must access the Council of Seven. But do let's be careful. Despite appearances, I have survived a lot. I would rather not experience death here. The Academy. My Academy. This place was home once. Now, I'm not sure what home even means. But I know one thing. I may be the last of my line, but the hope for my people lives on through me. I must try to save them. I must ascend. It is the only way to guarantee that my race will never be snuffed out. I... I believe that you will. I trust you. Curious. I was sure I would burst into flames if I ever uttered those words. Oh well. Come, Godwoken. Let's claim your destiny. The Voidwoken rears its head as you approach, its beady eyes looking past you. You glance over your shoulder and see Fane staring at it, transfixed. The Voidwoken hisses as Fane approaches. It calls him traitor, but it calls him brother, too. Fane's drive to uncover the universe's secret saw the Eternals cast into the Void. His hubris saw his people turned into Voidwoken. But the Voidwoken offers him a chance to redeem himself, to rejoin his people. If he accepts the God King's covenant, all will be forgiven. The Voidwoken claims that the Eternals can return to this world, that Fane can be home again. The skeleton looks back at you. I... I'm sorry, brother. I cannot. I cannot see this land destroyed just so we can rebuild our more imperfect world. I have a new home now. Thane looks around in wonder, taking it all in. This... this is my academy. It's where I did my research. Of course, it was a little less... Destroyed, in my day. <laughs> no, I was not one to keep drawings by my child in a place of work. And even if I had such things, I fear they would have been destroyed centuries ago. It also looks like someone's refurbished the place. No, there is nothing for me here. Only memories. And the immense power of several deities, of course. No. No, it was not. But there comes a time when a man must choose between his friends and a multi-tentacled, dark god-worshipping monster. Even if that monster was once one of your people. I knew it like the back of my hand once. Alas. Fane holds up a skeletal hand, turning it in the cool light. I left the back of my hand in a tomb a millennia ago, and much of my memory with it. But I trust you. You have taken us this far. I will follow you the rest of the way. After all that's just happened, life, every flawed morsel of it, seems more precious to you than ever. You look around at those who have accompanied you so far. In each one, something unique shines through. 
Divinity has eluded you so far, but humanity, humanity beats strong within you, here and now. Who knows what lies ahead for you, for your companions? Your quest failed. The void is growing stronger, and the hall is dark. You feel the need for some affection. Perhaps they feel it too. Know me? I believe we know each other rather well at this point. Indeed, I've made many notes on the major events in your life, and I believe personally observed many more. In fact... Fane stops as he sees the look in your eyes, somewhere between annoyance, amusement, and affection. Oh, to know me, scripturally. I, I mean, I rather wish, um, yes. Yes, I think I would like that very much. As you move to go below decks, the live wood creaks and groans. The steps you thought you knew lead you to a part of the ship you've never seen before. A newly carved nook that smells of resin and wood chips. Touching the wall beneath your fingers, the live wood hums at your touch. You understand that the Lady Vengeance has carved this space for you, in gratitude for your help. You enter, and feel the presence of the ship recede, offering you the total privacy of a moment alone with your companion. The first moment you have been truly alone together. The air between you cracks and shimmers with source. Despite everything that's happened, you allow yourself to enjoy a moment of peace. So, um, what exactly did you have in mind? Fane pushes you back, breaking the embrace. He steps away, a sad look on his skull. Please, it is all well and good to caress cold bone, but it just feels so empty. Don't misunderstand. I enjoy your company. I enjoy it very much. It's just, I feel nothing. Neither the strength of your hand nor the warmth of your touch. Is it? I would have accepted that once, but now, now that I know you, I, I think there might be a way, a way we could be intimate, but it requires absolute trust. In truth, I never dreamed I would have the opportunity amongst your kind, but well, perhaps I was wrong. You've helped me more than you know. You've opened my eyes to the merits of this world, if you'll pardon the expression. This land is so much more than a wasteland to explore. It's people more than specimens to be studied. My life is more than my obsession. At least, with you it could be. This notion of mine is not without risk, but do you trust me? And I trust you with more than my life. Fane reaches out his hand. Fane bows his head and sore starts to swirl around his bones. It outlines him in a green glow, shimmering about him as if his spirit was stepping out of his body. Take me. Just a bit. Just enough. Your vision starts to blur as his source trickles into your body. This will work much better if you close your eyes. Please. You close your eyes and the world around you disappears, but a new one takes its place. You're surrounded by rows of angular stone shelves, each one packed full of books. You're standing in the academy, but where you saw a cold, broken ruin, this place feels warm and welcoming. It feels like home. You reach out to one of the cases when there's a cough behind you. You can grab me all you like, mortal, but a man's books is nothing sacred. You turn and see Fane. Not a skeleton, not a mask, not some shadowy hooded figure. You see Fane. He's leaning against a desk, a four-headed staff in his hand. His bluish-gray skin shimmers in the gentle light of the library. He walks over to you with slow, smooth steps, his staff clicking sharply against the stone. As he gets closer, you can see his eyes, which look black from a distance, are actually filled with tiny points of light. It's like gazing into the cosmos. So, where were we? His skin feels smooth, like well-loved leather. It creases into a smile as he gently leans into your palm. I must admit, my research never covered ways to entertain cherished colleagues as they're pulled into interactive memories of your past. Is that not accurate? We certainly work together. I suppose, given all that we've been through, 
Friends would also appropriate nomenclature. He leans in with a smile, his lips meeting yours. He steps forward, taking you in his arms. Your hands run down his chest, across silken robes. He smiles shyly as you break off the kiss, but you notice a look in his eyes. Perhaps you would prefer something else? I could find a mask if you would feel more comfortable looking at one of your own kind. Fane hoists you up in the air, walking back to his desk. He lands heavily against the desk, sending immaculate piles of paper flying across the floor. He pulls you on top of him with a grin. His heart races where your hands press down on his chest, and you can feel him growing, not just where you'd expect, but everywhere. His body seems to move and change to your pleasure, but all you can see are his eyes, a kaleidoscope of darkness and light, like the universe staring up at you. They draw you in, and as you press down on his body, you can feel yourself twisting, falling into those eyes, falling into infinity. Well, that was... My word. I mean, I never imagined. Especially when our previous encounter went so disastrously wrong. I mean, thank you. No, I do. I truly do. Before you, I moved through this world like a ghost. I tried to see everything while remaining unseen. I touched nothing. Was touched by nothing. The greatest horrors and heroisms were no more than footnotes to me. But you... Fane takes your hand, interlocking his fingers with yours. You saw me. You touched me. You showed me just how little I knew. So yes. Thank you. Yes. Well, I just wanted to say it. You were most... unusual. Coupling for us is a more ceremonial affair. This was briefer. I remember the conception of my little girl took almost a day. But for all its brevity, this was... It was glorious. Alas, I fear reality calls. We had better get back to the others. Well, hello again. I'm still thinking about... Well, all of it. I should probably take notes. But it just doesn't seem important right now. As much as I would enjoy sailing these waters with you, I fear our time is short. I believe Malady recommended speaking to the ship's head when you were ready to leave. But I suppose it all depends on how much faith you put in a half-demon. Do you know, this Ark's place doesn't look half bad. It's only about one-third bad, really. Maybe two-fifths, depending on the weather. Oh, yes. I mean... Well, yes, it was rather pleasant, wasn't it? After all, it's not every day one gets a glimpse into the past. Oh, you were missing out. The architecture really was really quite... Uh, I, I mean, you were also quite... That is to say, you, um... I enjoyed it very much. Fane looks confused for a moment and rummages about for his notebook. The book is halfway out when he feels the squeeze of your hand and pauses. After a moment's hesitation, he smiles, returning the notebook to his robes. I do believe my notes can wait. You stand hand in hand, watching the world around you. It might be a grim time, but at least you're together. You reach for your weapon, but as the small void woken skitters forward, you get the sense that it's not here to fight. It looks at Fane, clicking and chittering in excitement, and introduces itself. Fane starts in shock. He knows it. The Void Woken was a colleague from Fane's days at the Academy, his assistant. It claims it knows how to save the Eternals. It promises Fane that if he can snatch the powers of the Seven, then he can restore his people. Not under the rule of the God King or the Void, they would finally be free. Fane turns away, pensive and quiet. Even as a skull, you can see the pain etched into his face. Do you know this Ark's place doesn't look half bad? Important does not do it justice. She tells me there is a way to save my people. The power of divinity could bring them back. Not as monsters, but restored to their former glory. 
I could have my old life again. That issue is not as pressing as you might imagine. The Eternals cannot be eternal without the source your god stole from them. No, if they return, they will reclaim their source. The source that was used to create you. If the Eternals come home to this world, they... We will live in it as your masters. You will be our slaves at best. Our food at worst. I... I'm not sure. I need to think about this. It's just... They're my people. Although... Well... So are you. I'm sorry. I can't... I can't talk about this right now. God Woken. Dallas told me about you. You must be as hard as diamonds and twice as bright to have come so far. Your Divine welcomes you. Surprise! Lucian frowns at the figure, then bestows a benevolent smile upon you. All that you know of him flashes across the panorama of your mind. You open your mouth to speak. I underestimated you, Godwoken. You have proven to be a formidable foe. You have my respect. Respect, indeed. Lucian's gaze rests upon you and goes through you. He takes your measure entirely. Lucian, we should tell the Godwoken the truth. Yes, I agree. It is time we dropped our masks. Dallas nods, then reaches for the sides of her head. Where there was one face, suddenly there are four. She takes off the mask of the shapeshifter. A skull is revealed, bejeweled and ancient as the void. I am eternal. Surprise, surprise. Fear not, Godwoken. Dallas is on the side of all that is good. She is helping me rid Rivalon of the influence of the Source. Listen to her. I shall tell you the tale as I told it to Lucian. Long ago, the Scholar Fane discovered that the veil between the world and the Void was made of Source. Our Seven Lords desired this power. Of course. Silence, slave. Our King forbade the Seven to reach for this power, but they didn't listen. Instead, they rebelled and sent the King and his people into the Void. With the Source they stole from the Veil, the Seven created the races so they would have worshippers. During their lives, worshippers collect Source. When they die, the gods feed from them. It's an ingenious system. Our souls are nothing but vats for the Source-hungry gods. The Seven made a mistake. By taking its source, they tore a hole in the Veil, and it is through this hole that the Void finds its way into our world. The Seven's lust for power let in the Void. Our goal is to close the hole they created, to restore the source to the Veil. When we are done, there shall be no more source in the world. No more gods, no more worship, no more war, no more chaos, no more demons, no more Void Woken. Rivalon will have peace at last. My people cannot be allowed to return from the Void. They are tarnished. They are Void Woken. They can only bring chaos and death and... There is more, but she hesitates to share it. Then she decides that she must. I was but a child when the war started. The king, in his fury, separated my family and scattered us across the world to be... entombed. He did this because it was my father who gave the Seven the secret of the Veil, against the king's explicit instructions. Ironically, the king's punishment is what saved me from the Void. Only a very few Eternals escaped banishment. Myself, my mother, and... Fane. Yes. Fane is my father. What? No. It can't be. Everything Dallas did. It was all you. Child. 
Everything I did, I did to fix your mistake. Our people, every purged sorcerer, every dead magister, all those weeping families, they're on your head, father. And now, in my mother's name and my own, I take my revenge on the king and the seven. And to you, father, I offer the opportunity to atone for your sins. Did you even look for me? Father. Dallas, control your emotions. Our purpose transcends your personal wounds. You! You are right. Dallas has her reasons as you can see. I seek peace for Rivalon, and for myself. Her ambitions align with my own, and I always believed the goal justifies the means. During the war, the real Dallas found my tomb. I took her place and quickly realized that Lucian was the key to my vengeance. And I was the key to the salvation of Rivalon. While Dallas sought the Eteran, I started draining the gods of their source. Slurp, slurp, slurp. One more word from you and I shall use the leash. I had to hide from the gods. So I had the walls of this crypt equipped with tenebrium and protections put in place. It worked. Everyone, even the gods, thought me dead. As divine, I was created, empowered to stop the void. I was the avatar of the Seven, their strength and their weakness. My bond to them allowed me to drain them of their source. Indirectly. And when the Death Fog was unleashed, many elves died. With fewer elves to worship him, Tyr Sandilius weakened. This gave the God King his first real foothold back in the world. To strengthen himself, he sent his Void Woken, the remnants of my people, to hunt down the sorcerers seeking to reclaim their source. We turned the appearance of Void Woken to our advantage. To fix the veil, all source needs to be removed from the world. Blaming the sorcerers for Void Woken made them easier to capture. The Eteran now contains almost all of the source the Seven stole. Soon, we will be able to heal the Veil. The Void shall be banished, and I, Lucian the Divine, shall return from the dead. A false Divine, of course. I shall have no power. But the world will not know this. I shall demand peace, and we shall have it. The plan is almost complete. We have made so many sacrifices, Godwoken. All of us. Of ourselves and those we love. One last sacrifice is required. For the future of Rivalon. You must surrender your source. Decide. Be the true hero and give up your source. Or be forced to submit. Like a coward. Like a slave. There is no other way. The source of the world is required to close the veil. All of the source. We only lack yours. As I say, one last sacrifice is required. Yours. Good. You understand. The world shall not know this. I shall return from the grave. A divine without power, yet all who desire power shall fear me. I shall carry the secret of my lack of divinity. Peace shall reign. Then let us proceed. Show some responsibility, Father! Surrender your source! Sealing the veil will lock our people away forever. They will never be free of the void. Though if they return, what becomes of this world? Fane turns to you. In all the time that you've traveled together, you've never seen him like this. He's trembling with emotion. And you, my fellow adventurers. Together we have seen more than generations of mortals could ever see. 
You have seen the horrors of the Void, and I... I have seen this world through your eyes. You showed me how beautiful it really was. There is no one else I would trust to make this choice. Whatever you decide, I will follow. You'll be a hero. Everyone will know of the sacrifice you'll make. Your name will be synonymous with the survival of Rivalon. Don't let them do this to us. But our souls? There has to be another way. No, never. I understand. Sacrifice takes courage. But I shall help you, though it pains me. Your sacrifice shall be made for you, Dallas. I'm sorry. You've come such a long way. But there is too much at stake. This is the end. Well then. This is, as they say, it. I never dreamed that after all this, I would be standing here with one of your kind, let alone that I would be proud to do so. I cannot imagine someone I would trust more with divinity, including myself. Fane lays a bony hand on your shoulder, squeezing gently. Do you know? I believe you will. Fane is reading a volume of Cranley Hubert's famous encyclopedia. He leafs through it slowly, muttering to himself. I see. Hmm. Intriguing. He glances up at you, big, empty eye sockets taking in every detail. Well, well, there you are. Another fine specimen of your kind. A little leaner than when we first met, and a little less divine than you'd hoped, I imagine. As do I, it seems, whatever that life might be. Fane looks back down to the book, a bony finger running across the embossed leather cover. It could have been different, you know. I could have saved them. I could have found a way. No, I imagine you can't. I imagine no one can. But the cards were dealt, and my people got snake eyes. Or something. I never took the time to learn how the average Rivalonian entertained themselves. Then again, you are no average Rivalonian. Not after this. So, what do you think you'll do now that we live in a world of minute divines? Of that, there can be no doubt. I'm sure the bards will sing of your heroics for generations. The skeleton hefts Hubert's dog-eared encyclopedia. It's weight heavy in his hands. I've been rereading this book, looking over your history once again, poring over every detail with a new perspective, and do you know what? It's shit. Fane tosses the book over his shoulder. It flutters in the air as it sails over the ship's railing and disappears with a faint splash. If you have spent your life staring at a thing, you can write about it with knowledge. You can write about it with love. But it is almost impossible to write about it with wonder. You creatures have spent your lives trudging about this world, and you've grown blind to its miracles. Simply that to see the true beauty of a thing, sometimes you have to look at it as an outsider, as someone with fresh eyes, if you will. Take otters, for example. Energetic, waterproof cats, utterly beautiful creatures. Or octopuses. Did you know they're secretly pl- Octopuses? Octopi? O octopods? Oh, I shall have to look that up. Regardless, the world is filled with absolutely incredible sights. And who better to catalogue them with the awe they deserve than someone seeing them for the first time? Do you know, there is the idea that nothing is ever truly created or destroyed. I suppose we are all source, just in different forms. You being the cruder, less jewel-encrusted form. Naturally. But my people were Source too. Although we didn't know it at the time. And our Source helped create you. In a way, I was walking alongside the best version of them the entire time. In you, I found a home better than the one I was pining for. Thank you, my love. 